So this morning we're in John chapter 12, reading verses 12 to 19. I'd invite you to give your now to the reading of God's Word. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your King is coming riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy, but after Jesus entered his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason that so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. And, uh, and I'd love it if we could just take a, a few moments here and pray. If you'd pray for me and we'll pray for one another. Let's join together. God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the scriptures because, Lord, as your word says, we know that, that the prophets don't speak on their own, that they are carried along by the Holy Spirit, that the, the whole of scripture is, is God-breathed, is inspired by you. And therefore, Lord, we know that, that the truth of your word is this. As it says, your word is alive and active. This is not a dead word. This is a word that you use, Lord, to speak into our lives today and to change us, to transform us. And that's our prayer today, God, that you would change us so that we come in to worship today, encounter you, and leave as different people to the glory of Christ. Or it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Uh, so today we're continuing this series in the Gospel of John called Come Alive. And, and I, I'd like to invite you, first of all, to consider the truth, and this is the truth, that, that God has an agenda. The God of the universe really does have an agenda. And that that agenda, his, his desire, the deepest desire of the heart of God, right, is that we would have life. We read just this week in our journey through the Bible, our, our readings together, we read John chapter 10 and verse 10 where he says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. A rich and satisfying life. That's actually, that's why Jesus came. That's God's heart for us, that we would actually have what is life? And the good news is, too, that, that actually anybody can have this life in Jesus. It doesn't matter what we've done. That doesn't matter. That's not, that's not what this is about. It doesn't matter who we are. Anybody can have this. And, and in fact, you don't have to be rich. This is really good news, right? You don't have to be rich to re lead a rich and satisfying life. But also, you don't have to be poor. Right? This is for anybody. This is for everybody. The only requirement, really, honestly, the, the only requirement is that we would put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That we would receive Him. That we would submit our lives to Him and call Him Savior and call Him Lord. That is the only requirement. Because what He has told us in the Word is, and, and listen, lots of us have experienced this and we give praise to God for it. What the Lord has told us in His Word is that when we receive Him, when we say yes to Jesus, that we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. The way he describes it, Jesus says, it's like you're going to be given this, this spring of living water inside of you, and it's going to well up in you and overflow into eternal life. To, to know what is truly life. It's like a stream of water is going to be placed in you that's going to fill you with life, this rich and satisfying life. He's talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God given to us when we invite Jesus into our lives. The, the scriptures tell us that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit would actually come and make a home with us. And so if you could think of, of your heart as like, a, as like a little room, uh, and that Jesus is, and the scriptures say this, he's knocking on the door of that room of your heart. And if you open the door to him, what he says is that he'll actually come in. Now he's going to do some redecorating to be sure, right? But he will come in, and you will actually know what it is to have the presence of the living God in you. That is what is truly life. And so in this series, what we've been talking about is, you know, what is this life? What does it look like? But also, and, and I think most essentially, how do I actually have that? How can I appropriate this gift 
of life in Jesus. I want to actually know, I want to have what is this rich and abundant life. How can I have that? And so today what we're going to focus is um, on what really is one of the most dangerous and effective thieves of this life that Jesus has for us. One of the things that can most readily take from us the peace and the joy and the abundance that Jesus wants for our lives. And that, that enemy, that thief, is called fear. And, and I, I couldn't get away from it. I, you know, the Lord just kept bringing this, this one verse before me. And so we actually, we put it right on the front of the bulletin. Uh, this verse just kept coming to mind again and again. Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming. Right? This, this, this phrase, listen, you don't have to be afraid because the king, the king is here. And so I'm hearing this verse, and I'm getting this from God, and and I start to have this sort of discussion from God, because I don't know if you remember this, but a few weeks ago, I spoke on fear, and I'm I'm thinking, God, they're going to wonder what's going on. Like, is this just a retread? You know, what, uh, what are we doing? We're talking about fear again already. And I don't know about you, but every time I have an argument with the Lord, I lose. Right? I I don't know if that's been your experience, but I'm telling God, like, why we should not be talking about fear again already. And the Lord says to me, essentially, and and, are you kidding me? Like, my most frequent command in the scriptures is do not be afraid. I think it's okay to talk about it a few weeks later. And also, are you kidding me? Do you not think that I want my people to have more than one weapon in their arsenal against fear? Right? And so I'm like, okay, God, we're going to talk about fear today. Right? And specifically, what we're getting after is, is how we can have confidence, how we can have confidence, how we can overcome fear with knowing, really knowing the sovereignty of God. That's another word for the authority of God, that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings, that He has all authority, He has authority over our destiny, He has authority over all of history, He has authority, He is the King of of kings. So first things, I want, I want to invite you to see here from the scriptures that uh, just this truth, the, just the fact that the king has come. So point one here, the king has come. Now, it might not at first seem all that significant, but, but if you'll go with me a little bit, let me explain that there's actually great significance in the fact that Jesus was riding on a donkey, right? Because Jesus could have actually walked, right? I, don't, I, I never really thought a lot about this before, but Jesus actually wasn't tired, right? In fact, Jesus was in the prime of his, his physical health, right? He's a young man. He was very healthy. He was very fit. People in his day were used to. They were accustomed to walking long distances. This was not something that he, he had to be on a donkey because he was tired. That wasn't the point. In fact, he was only coming from Bethany, which is a short distance from Jerusalem. So what's the point? The point is that Jesus is demonstrating, he is showing by this action that he is the king. Because this whole activity, right, being on a donkey, that donkey, we don't think of him this way, we think of donkeys as being pretty silly, but but a donkey was actually a royal animal, right, going all the way, it's traced back to King David. It is a royal animal and he is on it and he is riding, he's processing into the city and that is an action that a king would take. Everybody knows it, right? They know this is the activity of a king. Jesus wants to be clear and to reveal to the world that he is the king of kings. So our scripture says that the people who lie in the road that day, they shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the king of Israel. See, they understood what was happening, that he was revealing himself as king. And I want to call your attention to the word that the New Living Translation, right here at the beginning of what they're shouting out, I want, to, I want to call your attention to the word, to the Greek word that's translated, praise God. Because it's really interesting word, really a lot to it, right? So, it's translated here, praise God. Why? Uh, because it is a word of praise. I bet you'll recognize it, lots of you, when I tell you. The word in Greek is Hosanna, right? Folks, recognize that word? Hosanna. It, it is, by Jesus' day, it is a declaration of praise. It's kind of like when people shout amen, and I, I, I want to invite you, if at any point during the sermon you feel encouraged, just to shout amen, right? It's a declaration of praise. It's like saying hallelujah, or we clap in praise of God, right? It is a declaration of praise. Now, here's why it's interesting. Because literally what Hosanna means, what that word means in Greek, literally is please save. 
please save. Now, wh why is it that a word that literally means please save would become a declaration of praise? And I'll tell you, the only, the only way that I can figure this is that people were crying out to God, please save, crying out to Him, Hosanna, please save. And they were finally, God really did. <laughs> that God showed up in their lives. That God moved, acted on their behalf. And so this petition, please save, also became a declaration of praise because God is the kind of God who saves. God is the kind of God who shows up. And so I want to call your attention to just the fact that the King of Kings, the Lord of glory, showed up. That He came. That, that Jesus, it is good news just simply the fact that Jesus came because it means that He really does care. That the God of the universe really does care. And would you, would you be willing to hear and to receive this news today that, that actually God, the God of the universe, is moved by your struggles. He is touched by your pain. He remembers and records and keeps your tears, each and every one. The God of the universe is moved by your struggle. And so we take courage just in the very fact that the King has come, right? The King has come, and it means that He cares for us. But not only that, and now we're moving to the second point here, and that is that the King is God. The King is God. And we take courage in that fact. Listen, one of the saddest stories, the saddest stories in all of the Scriptures is recorded in Ezekiel chapter 10. Because what we find there is that God gives the prophet Ezekiel this vision. And it is the vision of the presence, the glory of the Lord leaving the temple of God. The glory of God, the anointing, the presence of God is going to leave God's people. God gets up and God heads east. God actually, the, the glory of God departs from Jerusalem, departs from the temple, across the Kidron Valley, heading east and up over the Mount of Olives. Now, why is that significant? Because, because God not only gives Ezekiel a vision of the glory of God leaving the temple, but God is actually also going to give Ezekiel a promise. A promise that the glory of the Lord will return. And so, we find that it is not a coincidence that when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, revealing Himself as King, that He takes that very same route in reverse. Right? He comes from the east, down the Mount of Olives, across the Kidron Valley, and into Jerusalem. And John declares at the beginning of his Gospel in verse 14, we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. You see, the glory of the God is back, right? The glory of God is back. And not, not come back to dwell in a building, not a facility made by human hands, but actually come to be with any who would receive Him. Any who would receive Him would know His personal presence, His power, His anointing. All who would trust in Him would know it. Now, we're going to talk about a couple of prophets today. We're going to talk about Zephaniah the prophet and Zechariah the prophet. So, Zephaniah the prophet... <laughs> He is inspired by God looking forward to the day of Jesus. And he describes here how it is that God looks at those who are His. On that day, the announcement to Jerusalem will be, Cheer up, Zion. Don't be afraid. For the Lord your God is living among you. The King is here and the King is God. Right? He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With His love, He will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. And so, <laughs> I'm praying over this part of the sermon. And I'm thinking over this. And, and, and there's this phrase that keeps coming to mind. Keeps coming to mind. And it takes me a while, but eventually I get it. Okay, that's you, Lord. And you're giving me this. And what the phrase that kept coming to mind was this. If you only knew how God feels about you. If you only knew. Right? And I'm thinking, God, that's such, a, that's such a, an encouraging word. Thank you, God, that you gave that to me so that I can deliver that to your people. And, and God is so good. You know what God did next? He said, no, wait just a minute. Because, Jeremy, I don't want you to miss that this is actually, it's not just about the people you're going to be speaking to. This is about you, too. I want you to hear this, too. I don't want you to leave this until you hear. If you could only know how God feels about you. And I don't really know, honestly, I don't really know how to express the assurance. 
I don't know how to give words to the, to the confidence that comes from knowing the release that comes from knowing that the king of the universe, the one who came to live among us, the mighty savior, this one that we know that there's nothing that we will face in this life that is stronger than him, this king of glory, that this one takes delight in you. So much so that, that the scripture says he rejoices over you with joyful songs. Can you imagine that God's joy over you is so great that he can't even just simply tell it. He can't just speak it. He will sing it over you. He is singing over you. When you woke up this morning, did you know that the God of the universe delights over you? That he is singing? Did you know that? That he has been singing over you because of his delight in you? you what place has fear when we understand that what place has fear in our hearts in our lives when we understand that the god of the universe sings over us his delight in us is so great and, and finally now and that, that'd be a good place to say amen probably um, so finally finally is is the fact that the king is good so the king has come the king is god and the king is good you know, when Jesus, Jesus cho chooses an animal um, to come into Jerusalem, he, he had, let's face it, e every um, animal uh, at, at his beck and call, okay? He's God, so he can do that. And out of any animal, he chose the donkey. And we've talked about how that was a royal animal going back to, da to David. But not only that, you see, the donkey was a symbol of humility and of peace. He could have chosen a horse, and the horse is really more of a symbol of war, right, of battle. He could have chosen a war horse to come into Jerusalem, but he didn't. He chose a donkey, and, and not even just a donkey, a little one, right, one that had never been ridden, a little one. He comes into Jerusalem revealing himself as the king of peace, the king who brings peace. And, and friends, that starts with how he makes peace between God and people. He does that at the cross. At the cross, he makes peace between people and God. And that is the true fullness of peace. Jesus knew that he was fulfilling this word from the prophet Zechariah this time. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Do you know, um, the King of Kings, the Lord of Glory, the one who, who holds our destiny, who holds all of history, that one, that one has nothing but goodness within him. Do you know that? Just think about this. There is never a moment when the Lord acts out of spite or out of resentment. There is never a moment where the Lord acts out of darkness, right? That he... There is no darkness in him at all, that he, he acts only for our good, that his will and his purposes and his action are all for good. He is righteous, but not only that, listen to this. The scripture tells us that he is victorious, yet humble. He is victorious, yet humble. You know, there are these two images in, in the book of Revelation toward the end of the Bible here. There are these two images of Jesus. And when I share these with you, if you haven't heard these before, they may actually seem contradictory, like they couldn't both be applied to one person. But both of these images are of Jesus. And if we're actually going to understand the fullness of who Jesus is, we have to actually hold both of these images at one time. This is from Revelation chapter 5. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping, stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne has won the victory. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is actually traced all the way back to the beginning of the Bible now to Genesis chapter 49, where Jacob is prophesying over his sons. And he prophesies over Judah. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah, right? He's prophesying over Judah. And he says this. He says, Judah is a young lion. Who dares rouse him? The scepter will not depart from Judah until the coming of the one to whom it belongs. I wonder to whom it belongs. <laughs> I just wonder. Until the coming of the one to whom it belongs. He ties his foal to a grapevine, the colt of his donkey to a choice vine. Now, 
Some may say that this is just a coincidence, right? That in Genesis, we, we have this prophecy of the lion of the tribe of Judah, this one who would come and take the scepter, who would have all authority. That might just be a coincidence. That might be talking about somebody else. And we might even say that this is just a coincidence, that Jesus comes riding in as king on a donkey, and the scriptures all the way back in Genesis 49 are saying, that, hey, this king, he has a donkey, right? Maybe all that's just a coincidence, but what I say what I say is that this is about Jesus. It is about Him. That God wrote the story of salvation long before creation itself. Long before time began. The Lord know, knew how He would save us. And He reveals it from front to back in His Word. Right? This is about Jesus. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the soon coming King. He is the Judge of the living and the dead. He is the one who holds all of creation together. He is. He has all authority. And so the message here is, don't mess with Jesus. Right? Don't mess with His Word. Don't mess, listen, don't mess with His kids. He declares that those who mess with His kids will be more than sorry. They will wish that they were never born. The Lord Jesus Christ is the King of kings and He fights for us. Right? He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. But not only that, get this, and here's where we're going to see what seems like it almost could be a contradiction. <laughs> not only is He the Lion of the tribe of Judah, but also this very next verse in Revelation 5. Then I saw a Lamb that looked as if it had been slain. And this too is Jesus. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is victorious. And yet He is humble. And yet He has given Himself for us. He is the Lamb who was slain. You see, part of what I think we're meant to see here is God's perfect timing. That God reveals Jesus as King coming into Jerusalem at the time of Passover. See, at the first Passover, the children of Israel, they were in bondage. They were in slavery in Egypt. And they cried out to God. And God said that He would liberate them. He made them that promise. And so God comes and He gives Egypt warning after warning, let my people go. Let my people go. And after warning after warning, God promises then to bring judgment on the land. He says, every firstborn son will die. The only way to be saved, the only way to be saved is to slaughter a lamb and spread the blood of that lamb over the doorpost. Literally, people would be saved from the judgment of God under the blood of the lamb. And now at this Passover, what we understand is that every Passover had always been pointing forward to Jesus. That He is, as John declares, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That He is. And at this Passover, at this Passover, we wouldn't be liberated from Egypt. We would be we would be made free from fear and sin and death into what is truly life. This is what Jesus has done for us. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. What I'm trying to tell you is that the King is good. Is that the King is good. And that matters. And that matters a lot because each one of us have to decide what we're going to do with this King. What are we going to do with this Jesus? We all have to decide. The Scriptures tell us that the King who came once will come again. And when He comes again, the Scriptures tell us that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But it is for those who will do that now, life is for those who will do that now. For those who would bend the knee to Jesus and would declare Him as the Lord of their lives, it is life for them. If you will take Jesus as your King, then you can know that you belong to the One. You belong to the One who conquered the grave. You belong to the one who's been declared in the Scriptures as the King of Kings. The one in whom there is all authority. The one, that, listen, that you're, gonna, you're not going to ever face anything in this life that is stronger than Jesus. If you will take Him as King, you will belong to the one who has promised He will never leave you or forsake you. The one who has promised that He has an eternal inheritance kept safe for you in heaven. He can be yours. He can be yours today, like right now. And what I want to do to close our service is, is for us to actually share together in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6, because there the Word of God declares, so we can say with confidence, this is what it says, so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? And what, 
listen, I want us to actually fulfill the scripture in this place, in this time, right now. I want us to fulfill the scripture. I'd like to say this one line at a time and have you repeat it back to me. But listen, listen, let's not say this in like in a whisper. Let's not mumble. Let us declare with courage and confidence in the face of the enemy who would use fear to rob us of the life that Jesus has for us. Let's declare in the face of that enemy, the Lord is my helper, the Lord is my helper. So, I no so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Praise be to the Lord. Amen. 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 Would you please pray with me? Oh God, we, uh, we do thank you and we give you praise. We give you praise for Jesus because what we know is that the King has come. He has declared, don't be afraid. The King is here. He's here. We give you thanks and praise because the King is God, that you sent your Son, your one and only Son, to come and, and to save us. And we thank you that that the King is good. That even while we were still sinners, that He gave His life for us, thus proving Your love for us. We ask for any, any person in the house today, any person who's watching online, anybody who's ever going to hear this message, Lord, that, Lord, You would touch their hearts right now and show them Your love for them, that You, you rejoice in them, that You sing over them with songs of joy. Enable them, Lord, to have the courage to put their trust in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.